and I just I just want to start this off saying I, I come here completely in good faith. Uh, you know, I have my beliefs, but I'm this is your space. I'm not coming here to argue with you purely. I want to learn oh, from fun. what your perspective is. Um, fuck it. Hey there, Gemma. Um, so <clears throat> one. There will, there is, was, and will always be a strain of insurrectionary anarchism alive and well, um, because there is always a need for direct action. Um, but it's rare you will find a anarchist today outside of pe- Look, I can never account for it, and I can never speak for Twitter. All right, Twitter is yeah. a, Twitter is a cesspool, <laughs> and uh, I they the everybody there who ascribes to something is wrong. Um, so I can never account for Twitter. So complete Twitter clause on everything. Right. But- I can absolutely agree with you as far as like the so-called terminally online. So I, but amongst those that are well-educated on this matter, I'm not going to bother doing the, the ethos, uh, rundown for you, but let's just say that there are, there are certain circles in which you can ask somebody about anarchism and you'll just end up getting referred to me. So I have a couple of decades of experience either from, uh, from the ground or theory and writing and stuff that's distributed globally. So I can speak with some level of expertise on the topic at least. Um, okay, I can definitely respect that. I've only been communist for about a year and a half at this point, so I'm I'm still relatively new, and that's kind of I, why I want to learn other perspectives. Um, so, with that said, I can never speak for all anarchists. Where a communist, y- y- nobody can speak for anybody. Blah blah blah. Right, hippie statement. But right. th- most of the ideologies can be spoken about by the various people adherence to that ideology communism especially being one of them marxist leninists can speak for other marxist leninists anarchism is unique in a few ways and one of the ways is that it's a stream with many tributaries um in the words of emma goldman it's not a uh, monolithic philosophy it's a, a network of ideas and we much prefer it that way um and so when you start to grasp the underlying structure you start to then grasp why it's as Taoist as it is it it is a living thing that is never of a singular moment it will shift and flow like water in the wind and so you won't find many anarchists that actively preach for a revolution or at least right. not how most people understand the term, at least. And like like I said before, there's a sort of fetishization of the French meta narrative of a revolution that uh, most of the left has glommed onto, uh, up to and including you know communists, MLs, Maoists, fucking you name name them, right? They 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 have that dream Absolutely. dream yeah. of the grand revolution, right? Um, anarchists don't operate that way. So when we talk about revolutionary acts, what you sort of what some of the reading that you could do on this matter, Bellemare, uh, Michel Luc Bellemare is a good example of this. Um, most of the revolutionary acts that we discuss are would be classified as micro revolutionary acts in response to micro authoritarianism, because anarchism it works interpersonally. It works at a grassroots. So this is like what Wordy said to you in chat earlier, that we would argue that the revolution is either unnecessary or occurs instantly. Because it happens the moment a person understands how anarchism works. Once you understand the concept, like you truly grasp it, you're like, oh shit, and it's done. And so once you understand that all you need to do to create a dual power structure, all that you need to really do to usurp the power of the state is just go build a mutual aid network with a single other person. You're already yeah, there. I, I, I can absolutely get behind that. I'm, I'm involved in several mutual aid networks. That's already, like, in, in if you work, you work small, you work grassroots, you work local, right? That person would have would have gone hungry. The state neglected them. Society neglected them. 
you provided something that created, now you have an opportunity there. Now you have somebody, and this becomes a force multiplier. This sort of becomes, and so you can create these pockets of resistance uh, against society. So you can cut, you can build a proverbial umbrella to protect people against the woes of communism or capitalism. Because ultimately, the anarchist critique is the same for functionally both systems is that they're they're both uh they both use a coercive uh, monopolization of force that's how both of them run at the end of the day if you don't do what the communist state says to do well they do what a state does if you don't do what the capitalist state says to do well they do what a state does it's through a vanguardistic monopolization of force that anarchists see this coercive, oppressive nature at play. And so ultimately, the resource allocation becomes the secondary issue. It's about the authoritarianism that it's going to take to necessitate the change, that top-down change that both capitalists and communists are after. Whereas anarchists go, yeah, your system is broken and you're, use, you're trying to use the broken system to fix the broken system and just the math doesn't math at the end of the day. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to feed a homeless dude. I'm going to make sure a woman has we- reproductive rights. I'm going to, you know, try try to protect some of these, you know, uh, uh, people of color from the local cops. I'm going to try and, like, I'm going to do that stuff. And I'm going to engage where I can engage because all of the other operations are functionally broken. And this is what got Bakunin and the anarchists kicked out of the first international and disinvited from the second international is because he confronted Marx directly with these critiques as, yeah, you may say that we want the same thing at the end of the day, a sort of stateless, classless society, but you're going to do it through the empowerment of the state, which we see as a negation of human, uh, of human right. Like, if, so ultimately, how are you going to justify a crime against humanity in the name of saving humanity from a crime against humanity. Like, that seems some fucked up, like, that, that's some, like, United States military logic right there. Don't worry, <laughs> we're, we're here to save you. Why are you burning my baby alive? We're here to save you, right? Like, it, it's, it's some twisted-ass logic at the end of the day, like, f- from an anarchist perspective. It's like, how are you going to get there? Through the empowerment of the state. But the state is the thing that's the problem, right? Yes, Okay. Also, um, does anybody have Rabbit's uh, video, uh, st- a Stolen Anarchy? Um, you, As a new communist, you should probably watch this. Uh, Tale of Twin Rabbit. Okay. Um, he, um, he's in it, it. Thank you, Zippy. Find me, find me a link, please, and thank you. Um, he's an indigenous. Uh, wh- there we go. Uh, Wordy has it in chat right now. You're going to want that link. Okay. Should I watch it right the second? No, 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 no. Um, okay. but it is, he is a professor. Um, he's an anthropologist. Um, and he's an indigenous, indigenous professor who specializes in indigenous anthropology. And okay. he, in that video will be exploring, um, how Marx and Engels basically stole and whitewashed all of their ideas. Okay, as I mean, as I personally, I am a Germanic pagan, so I would definitely love to learn more about indigenous yes. belief, um, and especially a critique from that point of view. Yes, it is. It is well. It is. It is regarded as you know, a high level expert document in, uh, from an expert in the field. Um, this is an individual who has engaged in. You know, I mean, he gets called for these sorts of things. Like this. Okay. He's yeah, that's rabbit is well known in certain circles as far as his credentials go uh, on this matter. Um, And (laughs) yeah, Deirdre, he's one of the smartest people I've ever been lucky enough to listen to. Um, Yeah, no, like I said, he is an indigenous man himself. And he is a professor of anthropology on indi- uh, a specialization in indigenous studies who has uh, archaeological uh, field archaeological dig experience and who also specializes occasionally in mass grave um, identification um, procedures. Um, and yeah, he um, in that video will lay out um, 
why Marx and Engels are kind of just basically frauds. <laughs> um, and so it's, you know, it's like, hey, they basically took a bunch of shit and rebranded it and sort of like repackaged it and kind of fucked it up along the way. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd definitely love to more learn more about that. I've definitely heard, uh, even in communist spaces, as I am, you know, normally attending, uh, where people do say that Marx very much took influence and just communism in general takes kind of influence from pre-colonial indigenous belief. And doesn't mention it. <laughs> That's the yeah, problem. Especially, especially Marx. I, I, I can acknowledge, you know, Marx, Marx definitely was kind of a bigot. And especially with Bakunin, I can tell you... Mm -hmm. I've read a bit into that well, whole they're all, they're, it's disagreement. Fucking, nobody can fucking, like, dude, three minutes ago. Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is, like, if we threw out every decent idea that it was had by somebody with problematic beliefs, we wouldn't have anything technological. We wouldn't have anything. Like, dude, society <laughs> used to be fucked. I can totally, like, work with, it's like, look, you know, you're going to find a lot of misogynistic, uh, you're going to find a lot of, like, you know, it's just par for the course, right? Right. But it's one thing to be like, oh, yeah, he was, you know, kind of a bigot like everybody. It was another thing to be like, dude, you stole your entire thesis. Right. right. And, and, and I can completely understand that and again that's why i want to learn what y'all have to say because yeah. i feel it is a genuine thing that needs to be learned be it you know currently i call myself a communist maybe eventually i'll become an anarchist who knows but i feel it's worth learning what you guys have to say uh we our main, yeah. our main critique is that fundamentally it's about how you do things. Sure. That's it. At the end of the day, that's like, that's the end all be all that it's about how you do things. You see my statement about like, Oh, we're saving you from genocide by committing genocide. Right. The, the means does matter. Right. It, Absolutely. It, that's, that's, I mean, I, I don't know how you guys feel about Trotsky, but that's kind of our main critique of Trotsky is, he he basically he calls himself a communist but in our opinion he basically he basically believes in communism with the white man's burden. He feels that until Europe becomes communist, no one else can become communist. That's our opinion as far as I understand it. It see and whether we're talking about Marx, whether we're talking about Lenin, whether we're talking about Stalin, I hope you have negative feelings about Stalin. I, I definitely agree. Stalin made many mistakes. I, my opinion is I feel we should take the things that he did what that did, were what, positive, such but as. we should also absolutely critique the bad things he did. Such, such, such as? What were, what were some of the, the positives to come out of Stalinism? Well, I mean... I'll be honest, uh, my personal opinion is without Stalin, uh, given the fact that 80% uh, of Nazi casualties came on the Eastern Front, uh, we may not have won World War II without Stalin, or at the very least, it would have taken many more critique, uh, critiques, many more casualties and much more time. Do you, do you, happen, to know, do you happen to know what about approximately 80% of that 80%? What uh, what group actually handled that? Mm, could I ask you to elaborate what you mean? I'm sorry, I don't fully understand your Stalin's question. Stalin's tactic was a very widely known tactic and is still utilized by nut jobs today. Um, it was throw bodies at the problem until the problem is solved. Now, so absolutely, uh, early war within the Soviet Union, uh, realistically, until... Any time prior to uh, the German defeat at Stalingrad, I completely agree. Uh, that's that's very commonly, like, it's very accepted that Soviet tactics were very behind the times. And absolutely, <clears throat> their tactics at the time were to just kind of throw bodies. Now, at Stalingrad and after, especially when Zhukov uh, 
was kind of becoming prominent, he developed new tactics for the Soviets, whereas they had the pincer attacks from the edges of the front, basically. Uh, but absolutely, that's a valid critique of the Soviet Union, where basically prior to Stalingrad, they were just... I wouldn't... Well, they didn't consider it and, throwing bodies, <clears throat> but you could definitely say they were basically throwing in, bodies. In there were no real tactics And in involved. classic Soviet fashion, did those bodies come from the Imperial Corps? Um, I personally could not tell you where, I mean, well, so, I mean, given the majority of the Soviet population came from the Ural Mountains to the border of the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany, absolutely, a lot of those bodies came from, uh, countries within the soviet union that were not necessarily russia now a lot of them did come from russia but absolutely we must acknowledge they also came from other countries within the soviet union mm -hmm. yeah. especially ukraine there we go by the by the millions uh in total racking up uh, ukraine alone accounts for probably depending on rough estimates six and a half, six and a half to eight million alone um, but, um, yes, absolutely. Stal yeah, I mean, I, Stalin's, the Soviets, Stalin's amazing the Soviets solution, 20 million casualties during the war. Absolutely. Stalin's amazing solution to winning World War II was throw the ethnic minorities at the problem until they're no longer there and then and, switch to a and new that's group. A valid critique. Absolutely. Like, so, I, I will not say, like, exa for example, outside of just casualties in the war on the front lines, uh, Volga Germans within the Soviets, for example, they were moved further to the interior because it was believed they would collaborate with Nazi Germany. Like, there's, there's absolutely critiques of the Soviet Union to be made. I don't see, I, I do see, this is what I'm saying is I don't see the good, right? Like a uh, dude on a campaign to conduct an ethnic cleansing was beaten by a dude on a campaign campaign to conduct an ethnic cleansing by conducting <laughs> an ethnic cleansing. Can I, can I ask who Stalin was trying to eth ethnically cleanse? A whole bunch of people, actually, when all was and, said and, and done. And this is not meant to argue. Like, I'm genuinely trying to hear what you have to say. Um, they, oh, God. I, I'd have to pull, pull a list at this point. The population transfers in uh, under, um, Soviet Union are so vast and varied and so amazingly large amounts that um, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so let's see. Oh, let's see. Oh yes. Okay. So we have some Azerbaijanis. We've got some Armenians. We've of course got the Balkars. Uh, we've got the Bolkovinians, uh, the Chechens, of course. Let's not forget the Dagestanis. They always need mentioning the, uh, I think the English are the da Dagestanis in modern day. You've got a whole bunch of Tartars. You've got a whole bunch of Estonians. You've got Romanians. Um, you've got some Greeks in there as well. Um, let's see, the Ingrian Finns, of course, were used in some, as, as, as some capacity. There were even Koreans, I believe, in some capacity. Kaiser, you're around, aren't you? Didn't, didn't Stalin use, uh, get around to a bunch of, uh, Koreans as well? Um, it was like a Korean diaspora. Um, you know, the I do know of, uh, Koreans who were captured from the fights against the border wars uh against the japanese who were used in the soviet army no yeah no this is like some other thing one of our people in chat oh, was is okay. like a whole like he'll absolutely have the details on that the kazakhs the tajiks the georgians uh the jello uh, russian russians lithuanians yeah like the list is a mile long like and i mean we're talking millions of people like these aren't small numbers like, just his forced migrations, like, just his forced migrations, which, again, is, you know, genocide by modern context. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Just, and and, just and again, I do acknowledge uh, the, the forced migrations were absolutely horrible. Um, like, yeah, like, if you do, do put up numbers. 
Um, and I mean, he utilized the World War II as a means of two birds, one stone, shall we say? Um, he absolutely saw like, you know, the, the various ethnic minorities uh, who were officially classed oftentimes as enemies of the people, right? They were, they were classed as anti-Soviets, though they were conscripted none the, uh, none the, uh, nonetheless, Right. And so, um, ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, dip- deportation of Soviet Koreans, um, was, um, an entire ethnic de- deportation of, uh, an entire ethnic nationality. Um, that's what they did to the Koreans in 37. Um, Sky Wizard. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other ball game. We'll get to that eventually. But like, you know, I mean, the Kulaks alone, right? Well, fucking, you know, that's a whole thing. But like, yeah, like, I don't see like, I don't, I don't, you don't get credit f- for like, even like, you don't, you definitely don't get credit for doing what he did, but you definitely, definitely don't get credit for doing it the way he did it. Right. Like, hey, thanks for hi- helping us fight Hitler. Um, Stalin. Right. Like these both are buzzwords for giant asshole. Like not a good dude uh, who did horrible, horrible things to a lot, like tens of millions of people. Um, And so like at the end of the day, yeah, yeah, he he fought. He fought Hitler. Um, Thanks. Um, But like we use we have a genocide currency on the channel. Um, and our, our reserve currency unit is one Stalin because he has the highest numbers. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm definitely all about criticizing Stalin or any other past experiment, as we say within the communist sphere of communism, because no, no communist country has gone without mistakes. Absolutely. See, this is where, like, I, I, this is, does the U.S. get a pass? Does, does, does the U.S. get, like, does, do they get, like, oh, they made mistakes? Oh, no, absolutely not. Okay, then this the is, US this is, is worse is, than anyone, in my opinion. Oh, okay, see, this is, you drank, you drank the flavor aid already, I see. All right, so, like, this is my criticism, right? Like, where does the line between mistakes and irredeemab- uh, irredeemability, like, lie? Because, I mean, how many tens of millions of if if he had killed a hundred million, would it stop being mistakes? Is it just that he's in like eight digits and he didn't make it to nine? Like, where does that number lie for you? Because I, th- that's the so terrifying part. Is like if if this group is the great Satan, right? To borrow somebody else's turn of phrase, but this dude over here, like this group, is yeah, they just made some mistakes. That seems like a linguistic rationalization that's occurring somewhere in your brain that worries people like me, that worries anarchists who who go, oh, the problem here is authoritarianism. The same, sure, absolutely. The same and, thing and happened I, I in both say, these instances. And I will say, I'm, I'm trying to understand where you're coming from, but it takes it's taking me a little bit of like thoughts and time. Because I'm so used to considering anarchists just part of the left, and for the most part, I, I assumed that y'all just agreed with us, no. but y'all believed in different methods. But I'm trying to understand where you're seeing basically the Soviet Union and America as the basically kind of the same evil. I'm trying to understand that. They're, it's taking me some time to think through. They're different manifestations. Of a uh, of a similar perverted thought process, that right. I can tell you what to do, and absolutely, I I can understand the anti-authoritarian part. Like I think uh, a good example of socialism in modern times would be, for example, Vietnam, which I don't. Can, I don't believe, as far as I'm aware, is particularly authoritarian. Like, the Soviet Union, absolutely not a perfect example. China, not a perfect example. I think, uh, you know, you look at Venezuela, Chile, before the coup, 
uh, Cuba, you look at Vietnam, I think those are good examples of socialism in practice. Um, and just so you know, um, yeah, Luna Oi has entered the chat. My wife. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a fan of Luna Oi. Of course you are. Um, you, you mean the land speculator whose land came from uh, a family who uh, stole land from indigenous people during the uprising? Yeah, not a fan. Um, uh, and which which country are you talking about? Uh, Vietnam. Okay, I'm, I'll be honest. I'm I'm a bit confused, and as far um, which I, I'll so, be honest, I don't know a whole lot about Vietnamese okay history. Um, v, so Vietnam's government is explicitly classified as an authoritarian class government. Okay, like that's your first thing, just like right out of the gate, right? Vietnam is explicitly authoritarian. Um, they um they like they will like good example, good example. Um, for when COVID hit, they had one of the best responses in the world. Why? Because they instantly used their military. It's a hundred percent. The military was on the street. They forced people into treatments. They, they quite literally declared war, like literally, literally like on paper, they declared war on uh, the coronavirus. The bases were converted to mandatory quarantine uh, sites. They like they absolutely will engage in that. They've got um, they've got a whole form of uh, digital authoritarianism that is the subject of multiple studies at this point um, that they're okay. sliding into at this point. Um, but like, yeah, no, they're absolutely authoritarian. Like. Like, okay, it, yeah, it, I mean, I, I'll fully see it. I don't know a whole lot about Vietnam. I know... Yeah, they are, they are a one... Some things, they but are, not a lot. They are a one-party state that uh, absolutely utilizes the military for enforcement against the, uh, against the populace. Okay, so kind of like South Korea. Sure, yes. Uh, only, like, you know, ran, again, same, same ball game. See, so, see, so, so Vietnam and South Korea. Vietnam has the communist aesthetic. South Korea has the capitalist aesthetic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, the same. The I same levels. I'm, I'm trying to the learn same, that the same levels of corruption. Communism and capitalism is the <clears throat> same. So yeah, the same that was, levels. That was me trying to say. Yeah. You know, I I can see how you guys can see both as the same. Like it's 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 we understand the nuances and the distinctions in how they go about doing things that like it functionally, you know, that um, the tr the financiers or the capitalist class in the United States controls the state. Right. You see the, right. the, the that That's sort something of thing. we can absolutely agree. Whereas on. whereas in China, the state controls the finance class. Yeah, but it's the same abused relationship. Ultimately, it's the same oligarchical relationship. The powerful and the rich are hanging out together in one giant unison, in one giant uniform body, and they're controlling society. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, and so, like, that's, that's sort of where we sit is like, okay, so what happens when you don't do what any of these powerful people want you to do in any of these places? Well, yeah, I mean... I, yeah, I can see what you mean. Uh, in both places, you'll probably get suppressed. You, it, you it, if you, if you, if you're lucky, <laughs> you will. I will, <laughs> I will point you to Kronstadt as far as the Soviet relationship to anarchists. Lenin openly declared, uh, Lenin declared open season on anarchists and ordered the artillery shelling of the anarchist club in Moscow. We were machine gunned in the streets under Lenin. And he was the oh, chill one. Absolutely, absolutely, Lenin. I can, I can fully see. I mean, I, I respect some of what Lenin said as a communist, but absolutely, he was, he, he was kind of a heartless bastard right. in his life. And, I can fully see and that. And Stalin was even crazier. <laughs> like it only got w way more unhinged under Stalin. So like this is, and I mean, Mao was a fucking raving lunatic. Right, like this is, this is the end of the day, you know. I mean, Pol Pot's fucking off the chain. He's just cult leader territory at that point. Um, but yeah, Gem uh, Gemma Lenin, we're very clever and influential, and you can trust us to operate society for everyone's benefit. Capitalists, we're very clever and influential, and you can trust us to operate society for everyone's benefit. Like that's Lord. It's called the Lord Acted Rule. 
Lord Acton, everybody knows the phrase. Nobody ever seems to know who Lord Acton is, right? Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I have absolutely heard that phrase. Yeah, it's, it's a British historian and philosopher by the Lord of, and the, by the name of Lord Acton. Um, so can I can I ask you a question from the communist per- perspective? And this isn't shooting, like, you know, I'm I'm not insulting your by, belief. By all I'm means, not, shoot. Genuine question, because uh, the, the main critique of anarchism from the communist perspective that I've heard is, you know, the revolution happens, right? Mm-hmm. And what we're always told is anarchists believe at that point everything's just fixed, and then the communist perspective is there's always going to be reactionaries left over. Like, how? How? What's the? What's the anarchist? solution to that issue like to reactionary counter-revolution okay one you don't put them in gulags let's start there um fucking you don't just start start committing human rights violations that's that's not it right 50 percent of what an anarchist does is education 49 percent is direct action the other one percent the modern anarchists will tell you just take that off and go fucking vote right just try and get your city council squared away federal will do nothing but absolutely absolutely um, so 50 percent of what we do is education 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 is the panacea right but education education takes many forms education can take the form of showing people through our actions that we can feed people we can house people we can organize things right um civil uh civil war um francoist spain right 50 percent of agricultural and industry at that time during in the middle of a civil war is being ta- uh, is being run by anar- uh, anarchistic communes right absolutely i fully recognize that right, i've like, studied the spanish civil war somewhat extensively i fully recognize like that this is we the proof the proof of the pudding is in the eating right and that's where anarchists caught time and time again, right? Anarchistic Republic of Kalspaya, small microcosmic example, uh, lasted for 375 years. Just fine. Like, ran, ran itself just fine. So here's the thing, right? The revolution happens. Again, you can see this, like, weird meta narrative that's imbued in the left and this sort of critique of fr- coming from apparently communists that, that you've spoken to that have never spoken to an anarchist, right? Right, like, and that's why... We don't believe in a singular revolution. A revolution doesn't happen in, like, it's not a singular event. Nothing in history is a singular event. It's, we, we give it a name because that makes it easier to teach in a textbook. It makes okay. it easier to convey to a person. A revolution is a thing that happens over a period of time. A revolution of the earth does not happen instantaneously, does it? No, not at all. Okay. So that's the sort of misunderstanding of what that terminology is supposed to encapsulate. Is that if we're to utilize the term revolution, what anarchists believe is a wide and varied uh, amount of stuff. And there is no singular answer to that question just uh, because there is no singular answer to what will be needed by people. What anarchists say is, well, we start by feeding people. And that's what we do more than any communist has probably ever done. Food Not Bombs sure. is operating in over 100 countries right now to this Absolutely. day. Absolutely. I, I, I actually support Food Not Bombs. boy, 100%. Right. Yeah. Like, w- this is what we do. And, and, like, and that goes okay. – sorry, to, I don't mean to interrupt. But that, that goes with my belief that whether you're communist or anarchist, like, I, I support mutual aid organizations across the line. Um. So, like, it, it's, one, we start there, right? Two, anarchists don't believe in a modern contextual revolution, right? I'm sorry. Communists, welcome to the party. I know that, like, communists have these, like, they, they had a little too much, like, what they thought was success when, in fact, they were some of the biggest spectacular failures in the history of history, Right? But I hate to break it to you guys. Neoliberal capitalism won. They won. Absolutely. 100%. They ju- they They've just, even ruined CPUSA. They just, oh, through Cointel Pro. 
that was, I mean, yeah, was say, they've been a captured entity since before fucking the FBI even existed. Anyway, <laughs> um, fucking, so like they won. There is no revolution coming. It's not happening. Like that's not yeah, just, it's a fairy tale at this point, which is why anarchism works and wins every day. Whereas communism will languish every time is because we're actively still out doing the thing we do. We never stopped. Look, look at every incidence of, shall we go back to say suffragettes, right? Let's look at suffrage. Let's look, okay. at, let's look at uh, civil rights movement. Let's look at gay lib. Let's look at indigenous rights movements, right? Look at those pictures. Right. Look at those photos. Look at those history books. Who's fighting next to them every single time? Anarchists. We're, we're present either to the side or the, in the background of every one of these sort of movements, because that's what we do. We bolster, we support, we engage because utilizing our lens of analysis, utilizing the tools that we have at our disposal for organizational methods, for direct action, for it just looking at the world the way we do, we instantly identify marginalized and oppressed groups. It's just sort of what we do. It's power dynamic analysis. It's Foucaultian in nature almost, right? Absolutely. Uh, um, so and, that and, and that's why I always say, you know, and that's why I th I believe I mentioned when I first came here, you know, I may disagree at this point with anarchists, but I always support my anarchist comrades because I do recognize y'all are always at the front of the fight. Like that's just, just honestly, even more so than a lot of so-called communists. Oh no, you guys, I'm sorry. You guys have a very bad track record. Very oh, absolutely. Bad. Absolutely. But I've, I'm very critical of my own, you know, people that call themselves communists because a lot of them just say vote Democrat and everything will be oh, okay. Oh, no, I'm not even talking. I'm talking, dude, as a gay man, communists don't get any love from me. Are you kidding me? Like, Absolutely. Communist countries have never legalized homosexuality. They're always— I, Not to disagree with you. I, I, would, yeah. I would point to Cuba in their recent thing, but— no, I get what you're saying. Historically, most con communist countries were opposed to it. Absolutely. They fucking like we 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 were lucky if we didn't get the death penalty. Like yeah, de like, and, that, and that's a very valid critique of communist countries historically. Like it, this has to do with this the the centralizing authoritarian nature and the patriarchal nature that communism takes takes form. They can say like communism loves to talk about like oh you know especially Maoist uh, uh, Maoist communism right they love to like the woman is the equal and the worker but how's that actually play out? Men yeah, I mean that's that's a very valid critique of communism. I completely agree with you. Like men, you know, I, men are going to do men much, stuff, huh? Yeah, I mean, his, historically, examples of communism have been wrong. As an as an ally, uh, I can absolutely say that, and be proud to say so. Uh, and I understand the I understand why LGBTQ plus people feel that communists may be opposed to them because of historical examples. I mean, it, you not. There's nothing contemporarily to help us either, like because that same strain keeps popping up in communist circles. That's that's yeah. I mean, it, like definitely, like you have like Has and Hinkle and the the what do they call themselves? Uh, Pat socks, which is basically just a new term for Nazbull. Absolutely, like they're absolutely bigoted motherfuckers that are calling themselves communists they're not communist mm. uh it, 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 so it, yeah I, I get what you're saying it, it's it's as far as from my perspective right it looks like the ones who say like well those aren't true christians or aren't, those aren't true muslims right it's like yeah but we keep noticing a pattern that your ideology keeps generating these people right like <laughs> no I, I completely get what you're saying like especially like with trotsky and all of them like yeah, absolutely. I, I I get what you're saying. Like, it's a valid critique of communism. Like, it, uh, and that and that's why I always say, you know what? As long as you're a leftist and you are an ally to people and you support the working class and the oppressed, I'll support you. And that's why I came into this conversation so openly, even though I don't know a lot about communism, but I do. I did have a bias against communism coming into it. Uh. But I came into it wanting to learn more. Do you mean anarchism? You know how you believe. Oh shit! Did I say communism? You did. 
Um, Sorry, I'm really okay. tired. I need to go to sleep soon. Um, uh, but yes, anarchism. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I want to learn more. Uh, uh, and even though I've been taught to disagree with it. I mean, we are a threat to communists. We are. We're act. We have historically, contemporarily, we are a threat to communists. That's why it gets taught that way. Is because we refuse to recognize a entity who has a philosophical foundation that sits upon oppressive thought processes. We refuse. And it, communism has that. Capitalism has that. Theological fucking driven, theologically driven bullshit has that. That's why it's no gods, no masters, right? Like there's, there's a reason it's yeah. there. We do not take kindly and we see it as sort of the root of all of humanity's problems is other people who think that when people say they don't want to do that, think it's cool with forcing them to do that. And ultimately, if you want to do that, go on over there and you can do that. Now, if you become a problem for an anarchist, if you start to impinge upon our way of life, now the tolerance paradox kicks in and we do not tolerate intolerance. So if you, Absolutely. if you want to do that bullshit, whatever it may be, right, and you want to do it with willing people over there, that's fine. But the minute we see you starting to force people to do stuff, which will happen under centralizing authoritarian communism or centralizing authoritarian capitalism, we perk up and the black block comes out and things yeah. happen. And so, like, that's sort of our fundamental qualm is that Marx's own texts, Engels' own texts, rely upon a monopolization of force to engage what they want. Lenin capitalized upon that. Stalin absolutely did. Mao did. Pol Pot did. Fucking Castro did. They all utilize a monopolization of force just as neoliberal capitalism does. Just as fucking... And if you start... It's an abusive relationship. If you start the relationship with a fundamental abuse, there's an original sin that needs addressed. Um, yeah, uh, the space pirates in Starfield, Sky Wizard, murder children. <laughs> murder children. They're not based. And they absolutely have a hierarchical organization amongst them. I've run that entire quest line, and I was depressed and sad at the end of it. I felt guilty. Um <laughs> Trust me, they're not based. Um, so, yeah, it was. Um, but like, that's that's sort of where we come from is this yeah. position and that, of and a that's fundamental why I came analysis. here to learn what you come from, because I, I really do want to know, you know, where you guys are coming from, uh, because, you know, I, I I've been told what I've been told about anarchists. But just as I came to communism with an expectation and I changed my outlook, I want to learn what you guys believe and potentially change my outlook. We, we are, we, we sit in a, a unique position. Um, I say between, but not ideologically. Um, capitalism hates us and fears us and communism hates us and fears us. And that's because we had the audacity to point out that they're a lot more similar than they would like to pretend to be. Can I ask you uh, one final question before mm -hmm. I go to bed? Okay, uh, so I just want to ask, uh, because this is how I feel with anarchists. I, I, I follow, like on TikTok, uh, a few anarchist uh, influencers. Uh, and generally everything they put out, I agree with and I support. Uh, but I just want to ask you, do you feel that between communists, with the exception of, like, actual communists, uh, and not just, like, Pat Sox slash Nazbol or like offshoots of communism that are obviously problematic. Would you agree that it, for the time being within America, anarchists and communists uh, should work together to oppose our common enemies in the capitalist professional managerial class? As long as communists would abide by a single rule. Okay. 
Y'all aren't allowed to organize anything. That's, okay, that's your guys' addiction, right? It's like, okay, you can work at the restaurant as a recovering alcoholic, but you're not allowed to work as a bartender, right? That will trigger you. Sure. We know I, it. I can understand that. Right? Look, I'm a member of CPUSA, but I'm also a member of, like, the SRA and a couple of other groups that we, are not communist. We and, need you yeah, guys I mean, I to that. never be in charge of anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's that simple because that's the problem with communism is that it has that intrinsic fault in how it wants to organize itself it doesn't engage in consensus decision decision making it doesn't engage in hierarchical organizational styles it does engage in hierarchies it does engage in vanguardism it does engage in minority rules Right. And so that sort of processes needs to never be engaged in because that underlies half, if not more of the problems that we see every day, no matter where you may be in this world. And okay. so as long as you guys just say, yep, I'm just here to do by all means, like I said, if you want to stand next to me in line and serve, I will stand next to you in line and serve. But the instant you say, I want to organize something, I'm a fucking have words because <laughs> that is, that's the trigger for most communists is they start doing that whole Vanguard shit all over again. And it starts small, but the next thing you know, you is, you have a committee and the next <laughs> thing that committee is doing decision making. And well, the committee has voted and the next thing you know, it's the group has to splinter into factions. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Especially, uh, I see Papa John Pig said, democratic centralism, baby. Uh, I, I can get behind that, absolutely. You know, I, I definitely think everything has to be democratically decided upon. So, uh, that's, that's, so, that's the condition. You know, whether they call themselves communist or anarchist, as long as it's democratic, I can get behind it. See, we get, we engage in what's uh, we, we do de consensus decision making in anarchist spaces, which can't most people can't even wrap their head around when they first encounter it. But a single person has a single veto. Everybody has a vote, but every single person also has a veto. Does that mean that any one person can yes. veto the decision of yes. everyone else? Yes. Okay, I'm, uh, I might have to ask you about that some other time. Yeah. I really do. It, <laughs> I need to wake up in four hours. Yeah, most people but... can't even wrap their heads around that one, and it takes them years to get it, or they just eventually engage in it, and then they're like, oh, I see how it works. But yeah, we engage in consensus decision-making because just because you're a minority doesn't mean that you shouldn't get equal representation in this process. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand that logic. I, I'm still confused <laughs> with one person how, how it can being work. able to veto anything, but... Yeah. It because it, you will get it. You go to sleep. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to go to sleep, but I'll definitely come back and I'd love to talk to you more about that some other time. All right. Sleep well. Catch you later. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, you know, educating me. Uh, you're welcome. We'll fix you. <laughs> Hopefully. Later.